George Washington, of course, the greatest of uh, the revolutionary leaders, was a Virginian. He had grown up on the northern neck of Virginia, which was a center of slavery in the first half of the 18th century. Uh, he was from a family that owned slaves, um, and he was part of a, a slave-owning culture. He had married a woman who, in fact, had more slaves than, than he did. So Washington was um, a slaveholder. Uh, he was part of that whole uh, generation and group of people that hadn't really questioned slavery until that era of the American Revolution. And Washington becomes increasingly troubled by it, of course. He's not, I think, totally easy with it at the time of the Revolution, but he he's also has to be a politique. He has to consider uh, that he has places where slavery is very strong and, slave, and, and other places where it's not. So when uh, slaves are enlisted in, uh, in, in blacks, in some free blacks, he bans it initially because he's afraid that it will upset other slaveholders and they will see this as uh, an incitement to uh, insurrection. But then he rescinds that order and, uh, and, and enlists uh, African Americans uh, in his forces and uses them as soldiers. And so Washington, uh, uh, we don't know what uh, all sorts of influences. We can speculate to some extent. He spent a lot of his time during the Revolution uh, in the northern colonies and with people where the questioning of slavery was stronger. And so he, he came to feel and he felt the contradiction of it. So that in the latter stages of his life, he wanted to end it. He really wanted to end his personal involvement. He was a very astute businessman. He had escaped tobacco planting, which was uh, a declining business uh, in, in Virginia at the time of the Revolution and in the 1780s. He had moved into the growing of wheat. Uh, he was also a land speculator in Western lands. He was uh, uh, a distiller. He was doing a number of business enterprises, and he really was moving into a business model that didn't need uh, slavery. And at uh, the time of his death, or before his death, in his will, he indicated that he wanted all of his slaves to be freed after his wife's death. He didn't want to leave her in economic need or want. And so after his death, uh, shortly after his death, uh, Martha uh, Washington uh, grew um, uh, uncomfortable with the feeling that there were people around her who were waiting for her death to be free. And so she freed uh, the slaves as a consequence. John Marshall was also a Virginian. He was a cousin of, uh, he was one of the Randolphs. He was a cousin of Thomas Jefferson. He was a member of a very prominent Virginia family and was a slaveholder right from the start, though he was predominantly a lawyer and not a planter, and that was always how he had earned his money. But he seemed to find no uh, great problem throughout his career with slavery. He was one who didn't, uh, didn't question it very strongly, maybe a little bit privately, but he certainly didn't bring it into um, any kind of legal questioning. Uh, he used them as household slaves in his office, in uh, uh, his home in, in, uh, in Richmond. Uh, he had about 10 slaves that uh, were household uh, servants. But as Chief Justice of the United States, he, uh, doesn't, uh, uh, use, uh, he doesn't use that position to uh, question slavery. In fact, the few times that it comes up during his Chief Justiceship, it's the private property question that seems to be more important. From Marshall. So again, this dilemma between private property and human rights. And there are two things that are, that are uh, as the modern age then is beginning, uh, that are so important. Uh, but for Marshall, it's uh, private property seems to be uh, the predominant consideration here. So even by the time he dies in the, in the, uh, in the 1830s, there's really no uh, prominent uh, questioning by, by Marshall. Hamilton, uh, again, uh, one of the revolutionary leaders, Hamilton uh, and Marshall were, were good friends during the, the revolution as young Continental Army officers. They shared the hardships of uh, a Valley Forge together. Interesting point about Marshall and Hamilton. But in regard to slavery, of course, Hamilton was from New York. He had been born in the West Indies, but uh, was educated and uh, grew up in New York. Uh, 
Um, he'd gone to King's College, and he had married very well. Uh, he married a very wealthy uh, young woman uh, in, in New York City. And he, he, didn't, he, he came very early on, absorbed these ideas coming in from the Enlightenment that slavery was wrong. And so he felt uh, very much by the time of the American Revolution, in fact, he supports the idea of uh, arming more slaves, the one that John Lawrence will put forward later, and, and, uh, and he and Lawrence were also friends. But he, wa he supported that idea uh, he joins, uh, in, the six, in the 1780s, he joins the uh, New York Manumission Society that's going to press for uh, uh, liberation of slaves and for the ending of slavery. So Hamilton was anti-slavery. Of course, he comes in an environment, in a place where slavery is not important in the economy, and it's easier for him to do so. And we might also add that we don't really get very much um, a criticism um, of him, of the slave trade, which was something probably he could have said more about. But again, it's, we've got to remember that this is in the early stages of the revulsion towards slavery. So we find that what Hamilton says is pretty much consistent with that. Colonel Lawrence was uh, the son of one of the great rice planters, uh, Henry Lawrence of uh, South Carolina, really truly one of the, the top of the aristocracy in uh, the South Carolina elite. And he, as a young man, of course, he's very well educated. He's absorbed the, the ideas uh, of the Enlightenment. Uh, he's very enthusiastic, very committed to uh, the American cause. And his idea is uh, that he wanted to initially arm 5,000 slaves. And, and actually, he thought, we get from his writings, of course, he's going to be killed during the war. And so he dies as a young man of 27. So we don't, his, his views on this don't have a chance to mature. But we see that he could possibly see this as the end of slavery, maybe, uh, or something that's going to uh, change it very fundamentally because he wants to arm and use the, these black troops uh, with the promise of freedom. He thinks that that's consistent with the new ideas and with the ideas of, of the revolution. He uh, uh, scales the idea back. He goes to South Carolina and uh, scales the idea back to 3,000. Washington is a little bit afraid that he's going to alienate uh, the big planter interest in South Carolina. He returns there to try to, and becomes a member of the legislature to try to persuade them to support the idea, but they don't. They're skeptical of the idea, the idea of arming slaves, uh, the idea of slave revolt, uh, all of that frightens them and they don't, uh, they don't support it. And so his plan ultimately is never carried out. It's one of those uh, uh, might have beens uh, that we have to, to look at. And it was again, some of the, the finest uh, ideas of the Enlightenment as they are expressed in the Revolution are expressed in Lawrence, a very brave young officer, heroic in a number of the battles of the Revolution and eventually is killed uh, fighting the British.